Hello, this is Ricky here from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, and you're watching Teacher Learning Cast with Peter Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. So there you go. Welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number six. This day, uh, the 23rd, 22nd, sorry, 23rd of March, uh, 2018. Uh, my name is Benjamin Stewart from beautiful Aguascalientes. Hello, everybody. This is Speedy Herrera, also here in Aguascalientes. Today, a special transmission on the 22nd at night, Friday, when everybody is going around and hanging around and uh, dropping jobs for a weekend. We are here doing uh, this video for you and, and hopefully to keep on with this idea of transmitting and casting, sharing experiences from teaching. And Benjamin Stewart, uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely, Petey. Yeah, really enjoy this. We, we've been, we started a little over a month ago and uh, certainly is a learning experience having the opportunity to share some ideas, what we're doing in the classroom. Uh, meeting up with some other people. It, we had a great week last week uh, with Ken Bauer, our first guest, um, as we're always looking for guests, always looking for others to participate in right. our broadcast. And um, we want to extend uh, an invitation really to anyone who wants to share with us. If they would like to be a part of this broadcast, uh, you may find information about uh, basically everything that we do with this podcast in Facebook under Teacher Learning Cast. So feel free to post questions, uh, provide your feedback. We're always uh, looking for ways to improve our uh, broadcast. So do let us know uh, what you think. And uh, every week we have different topics uh, related to teaching and learning uh, that uh, if you want to be a part of the conversation, we certainly encourage you to do so. Yes, and you can also contact us through our personal website. We have Benjamin's website, which is benjaminlstuart.wordpress.com and my own website, which is homers2000.weeksite.com slash pdha. It's a Y in PD uh, at the end and then HA. And uh, you can reach us. And this time uh, we will be talking this Friday evening, but we will be transmitting, uh, posting this video tomorrow morning so we can get used to Saturday's morning 8 15 is the appointment with us for special occasions and due to personal uh, situations. We are doing it Friday night this time and next week, which is uh, vacations here in Aguascalientes, a long, long weekend, kind of a pre-vacation, vacations in the rest of the, of the country here in Mexico. And we are also going to be doing something kind of different, but the idea is to keep on seeing you on Saturdays at 8.15 in the morning in the live transmission, but obviously will always have the available on-demand video. Last week, as, as Ben mentioned, we had uh, a very interesting talk about Flip Classroom with uh, Ken Bauer, and you can watch the video in the back. I have it as a background last week video, so you can uh, see what you missed, but you can go back to it. And today's, we will, uh, today's topic, we will be discussing about uh, deep learning, something that Benjamin has for us. And we will discuss a little bit something that is intriguing me about uh, in the classroom activities versus objectives, plus the, uh, the extra, the personal experience of the week uh, to share with you. So, Benjamin, first topic, the deep learning uh, situation. Tell us. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was thinking about our topics for, for this week, and I, I just recently purchased a book on my Kindle. I'm a big reader of uh, using Kindle for electronic books, and I came across uh, deep learning, and uh, this is a huge topic. As I started looking on my uh, socials, came across a lot of different uh, articles in my Twitter feed about deep learning, and I think it's going to be a topic that we can certainly expand on more, and certainly as I get more into this book, I'd like to bring up some, some things that, I, that I'm learning. But I think that um, today what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about uh, this idea of deep learning, and I think it really 
links to the more practical views that you're going to speak about here in the second segment about objectives. So I'm curious, Pity, what you think about some of these topics that, uh, that I came across in deep learning. Uh, the first is this article here under Ed Source. There's a couple of quotes here I wanted to share. And I think it's really interesting because I most of the deep learning articles that I read really relate to general education. And I, I always like to read these general ed, ed uh, articles to see how they relate to English language learning since that's the context that, uh, that, we're, that we're in as we're uh, teacher trainers for English language educators. Uh, the first quote that I came across says, not only do students learn, uh, but they develop the speaking and writing skills they need to convey their viewpoints. And this idea of conveying viewpoints, I think is really important, especially in English language learning, is that, is that we're not only just focusing on the, the development of skills, but we're actually helping learners, individuals, uh, human beings, form opinions and, and, and helping them be able to maybe argue a point, maybe persuade someone something, um, maybe it's uh, looking at how to resolve conflict, resolve some sort of problem. Uh, if we want to think in terms of problem-based learning, I think it's easy for us to kind of get caught up in the skills-based aspect of English language learning, and we forget sometimes of the, the higher level uh, thinking or the critical thinking that we, that we also want to promote. And I, I know the argument a lot of times is, well, lower level students, maybe a level one English language learner is not going to be able to articulate uh, in a certain way to even think about critical thinking or, or something along those lines. But I think that we can certainly do more. And I, I, and I really kind of throw this out there to, to all educators, especially English language educators, about how far we can push our students uh, to not only focus on the skills, but also the thinking, uh, the thinking aspect. Uh, this particular ar article also came from the perspective of schools when they mentioned that schools teach standard subjects, um, but many also include a collaboration among, among teachers uh, so that those subjects are taught together. So this article speaks from a learning standpoint and from a pedagogical standpoint in the sense that, you know, if you're working in a school in a formal context, you know, it's, uh, I think it's important for us to also reach out and feel like, well, you know, this is not something that I need to take on by myself. Maybe I need to uh, reach out to a content teacher. Uh, in our case, uh, PDU, maybe our, the English teachers reach out to the Spanish speakers who are teaching uh, you know, core classes like uh, history and science and math and, and really find a ways to link those subjects into the English language learning experience. I'm not sure, you know, how you think or how, what, uh, if this has come up in, with your experience working with teachers from a practicum standpoint. Uh, yes, actually, uh... I was thinking about uh, the idea of the courses on ESP that we teach, in which uh, the 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 origins of the ESP and and the main books about it. They talked about the idea of uh, not really having general English, but having uh, English uh, already determined by purpose, uh, and 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 it's pretty much. I I think it goes uh, around around this deep learning. And, and focusing not only on the skills, the abilities, the form, and, and the, the immediate meaning of, of the language, but, but the deep purposes of it and, and the internalization. I think uh, from what you just said, I'm, I'm, I'm going with uh, a little bit with the idea of uh, what I heard from Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate, I think it's the name, and, and he talks about feelings and learning, and, and, and it's one of the main aspects i think it goes along this so in, in the practicum strand uh yes uh, yes i think uh, one of the things we work and and maybe not as explicit as sleep learning but uh but we manage it as the context and the function uh creating in the students the need for really using the language 
uh, beyond the sake of just learning the phrase and using it, it the other way around. Create the need and then have, uh, have them to look for the ways to achieve communication. Yeah, and the, the same article they mentioned uh, problem-based learning, and I am going to be curious to know what your viewpoints are in the next segment, really looking at how to plan for that. If we're looking at problem-based learning more in terms of per unit, so maybe that, you know, we can, I think, think of cases where maybe we've, we're planning for the day, if we're talking about a day being a 50-minute class or 90-minute class, but really also look taking the planning of learning objectives to at the unit level where maybe we can incorporate or involve some sort of problem-based learning where the learning experience kind of extends over a period of several days, right? So, you know, maybe there's some small uh, short-term objectives that are met, but also kind of longer terms. Um, but really looking at problem-based learning and seeing how that can be part of the English language learning uh, experience through the creation or promotion of, of critical thinking skills. Um, the second article I wanted to share is related to deep learning. And uh, in this article, they talk about competencies and they list six, and I'd like to share these six uh, with you here. So the first competency, uh, mastering rigorous academic content. So for me, that speaks to the creative, co the creative thinking aspect. Number two, learning how to think critically and solve problems, and that's very specific uh, related to, to, to that, uh, that topic. Uh, number three, working collaboratively. Number four, communicating effectively. Number five, directing one's own learning. So it may be more in terms of self-learning or autonomous learning. And number six, developing an academic mindset, a belief of one's ability to grow. And, and that last one I think is interesting because that kind of speaks, for me anyway, uh, of the importance of having some sort of um, kind of repository of of work, you know, we've talked a lot about e-portfolios, whatever that might look like, but that there's some sort of paper trail or evidence that the learner leaves behind that is illustrative of that, that learner's knowledge, skills, and values. And so I think looking at deep learning from these six competencies, not to really dive in too deeply on, on all of these, but I think it's, um, interesting and, and, and I think even a challenge, okay, I, I will have to admit that a challenge to really look at all these six within an English language learning environment, but I think it's at least worth thinking about and seeing, again, how far we can, uh, you know, promote our students and help our students not only develop the skills, but also these other competencies that, you know, would really apply to any language or any learner, uh, regardless of the subject. Yes, Ben, I, I'm, I'm kind of recalling with us all this information, different topics that we have discussed before, the networks, the, the learning networks that we discussed in previous, uh, in, I think in chapter four, we discussed it and, and how it, it fits in, in all these ideas of working collaboratively and having the, the abilities to communicate effectively. At the same time, you develop your, or I mean, all the, it's kind of interconnected, all this, six aspects, and I was also thinking uh, uh, Programa START here in Aguascalientes, uh, uh, the national program PENIEF in Primarias, uh, for if anybody is watching from the program, they may know better this, and that uh, the lesson plans they work with are programmed by projects, and they are not focused in a one-day objective. They have a series of classes to achieve one small project in which they have to work with a structure, they have to work with vocabulary, they, work, they have to work with social relationships among students, they have to work also with uh, other kind of skills and competences to be developed to create things in which language is applied and through which language is developed. So uh, I observe in, in this kind of classrooms is that uh, somehow 
uh, it, it looks like learners are having a few contact with the language and it looks kind of slow but then all of a sudden you go to a third fourth grade kids primary school and boom they are already speaking and understanding and saying things because all of this kind of work which uh i think it's very linked to this deep learning idea and all these six um uh aspects and competencies to to master that you mentioned that are mentioned in this article yeah i think it's really about trying to find purpose and having students recognize the purpose of what they're doing that there, there should be a reason as to what they're doing why they're doing it and of course something that's relevant to them that's that's re that they can relate to that uh, of course, is part of their interest. Maybe it's part of what they their goals are. Um, but I think you know, for all of this, regardless of what kind of critical thinking skills we're trying to promote, it boils down to uh, purpose. Uh, the last thing I want to share here is a, a uh, an image that I think shows the. Now I don't know if this is big enough, uh, Petey, If this shows up uh, where you can see these two lists, one for 2020 and the other for 2015, is that uh, is that big enough? You think? Let's see if I can. I'm not sure if I can. Yeah, I'll try to make this a little bit bigger. But uh, I, this tweet, I came across this today. In fact, um, is interesting because it compares list of uh, specific skills that. Uh, that they are suggesting that will be important in the year 2020. And if, if we compare these two lists from, you know, from 2015, it's interesting uh, to see the, the differences and similarities, in fact. The first one being uh, complex problem solving. That seems to be the, uh, the number one for, for both lists. But it's interesting that in the uh, 2020 list, critical thinking really jumped up from four to number two, it jumped up to the uh, pretty high, and creativity from 10, ranked 10, it jumped up to, uh, to three, and I think that's really interesting, and I, and I have my own personal views of the meaning of creativity and what that looks like from a practical standpoint, and again, that's probably another topic we can discuss, but I think that just by comparing these two lists, we can kind of see a tendency between how we expect students to interact in, in the classroom. And I, I, think, I think we can uh, look at this new list in this list of 2020, more uh, critical thinking um, and uh, really looking at just I think uh, kind of creativity types of, of uh, opportunities where we're trying to create environments where uh, students are actually making something. If we want to look at kinesthetic learning, you know, making something with their hands, communicating and negotiating. You know, it's interesting to me that the negotiating is kind of at the end of this list because um, I, I still think that there's room for for a lot uh, of focus on this idea of negotiation because even with any type of collaborative work there is going to be some level of negotiation or compromise or consensus and i think we face this every day in real life i think that it's um, i think it's equally important to recognize within the classroom even the english language classroom that these same types of um, you know, behaviors that we would expect in real life, we might try to bring into the classroom. But I wanted to share this comparison, not necessarily go through every one of these, but I think it is interesting uh, how we think that some of these skills are gonna be changing over, over time. And I would dare say that the technologies that we use will reflect uh, these trends as well. Yeah, it looks really interesting because it, it, it makes me think right now, what about the, the kind of projects we are uh, assigning students? Uh, it raises the question about uh, the extent of the kind of paperwork we ask students to do when you ask them to research for bibliography or information, and, but what do you ask them to do about it? And, and are they really doing this critical thinking are they really doing this kind of um 
uh, intrapersonal work, like exchange with other students and uh, working with other people, this negotiation, all of these different aspects. Uh, and, and it makes me wonder, well, what about these huge, huge papers? We ask them and type and, and extract information and empty it there against small, simple tasks which make them maybe have a, a higher uh, level of uh, thinking or deep thinking through through doing a small task like a small essay like uh, and, and comes from mine itself and not from just the source and the book and 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 it and it's a kind of thing you struggle every day uh, what are they going to write about uh, for what they for example in my case in, in the practicum strength they do a lot of reflection. They come uh, with the idea that reflection is a description of what happened in the classroom and very few analysis or, or, or deep thinking about any aspect. So uh, I try to get to the smalls and, and get through the critical incidents one by one and, and having students do one thing at a time so they can start not just uh, sticking to the descriptions or or very superficial analysis, but try to get through through a major thinking, which sometimes I also stay at the surface, and and I also need this back and forth with them to realize that I'm just touching the surface, and and we need analysis. So, I, I guess these articles that you brought today are, are are really interesting in that sense because it gives a view of what. Uh, uh, I would say it comes forward, but not really. I think I've seen this kind of work in different schools already, and, and in Mexico and, and and mainly outside Mexico too. When I was teaching in in Southampton in Spanish, uh, the kind of projects that students were asked were this, where major uh, thinking is required. Yeah, I mean, I think this really involves looking at from the planning to the implementation to the evaluation or reflection of one's teachers of what they're doing in the classroom. Um, I would really encourage and uh, want to know how you're promoting uh, deep learning or deeper learning, critical thinking skills, especially in your English language classroom. What kind of challenges do you face? What kind of successes have you had? How do you plan for it? Uh, we really want to hear from you if you would like to share some of your thoughts about how you promote deep learning in the classroom. Feel free to share some of your ideas in Facebook. You can follow us there under Teacher Learning Cast, uh, let us know. Um, we would really like to um, uh, hear from you. And some of these topics, uh, we really have no problem going back if later uh, in another week or, or in the future sometime, if you want to discuss these, so we certainly can uh, do that. But um, I think that the this idea of deep learning uh, really links to this the next segment, BD, that uh, you were going to talk about regarding planning. And, and I'm really curious what you think about how this really ties in to these objectives. And from even maybe a short-term perspective from a, from a day class to maybe a, a unit over a series of maybe several days or even weeks. Right. I, I think uh, the topics match perfectly. Talking about this deep and the this view of self and the learning objectives and the de development objectives for students in 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 this kind of uh, different perspective of the classroom match uh, precisely with with uh, what I wanted to discuss today and and, and majorly again you, you know I'm I'm more uh, with the idea of raising questions in this sense uh, at a right maybe formulas that work one way or or in different way with students. But this is one of the aspects that, that I've come to realize that may interfere uh, big time with the happenings in the classroom and the successful achievement of the development of the language. Planning the classes based on one activity or on one core activity or one task you want students to do or really think about the objectives of it. What do you want students to achieve through uh, doing something. Uh, and, and I think we have discussed this before you and I uh, in the halls uh, in, in, at work. Uh, for example, things like activities like games 
activities like um, activities which are uh, uh, complex elaborated in the process which ha they, they have many steps to follow maybe activities like the ones i mentioned huge assignments for students to go and do research and and the point is uh how much do you get to achieve in language classes language uh, learning classes uh how much you get to achieve of the practice you want students to have if it is a, a presentation of information or if they are really using the language and how they are using it and if all of the steps and all of the small activities that they go performing uh, in the process are they worth it for the amount of practice or exposure to the language that would be mainly the term uh, in, involving practice of exposure to the new language that is the objective how important is for the teacher to really understand what the objectives in the class are uh, at it, with difference to the task and activities to perform during the class uh, so so that's pretty much the idea Ben I don't know what you think about this this uh, main uh, setting about activity versus the objective well yeah I'm, I'm curious I've got a lot of a lot of questions actually for you but I, I wanted to start by asking you know when you work with your students how much time or how much of a challenge is it for students for them to recognize the learning objective versus communicating that objective to their students and then I know it's related but you know what's your experience been with those two aspects how they look at it as far as being able to recognize and we can talk in, in a few minutes what those objectives are or how those are articulated but just <laughs> yeah. From your, yeah just from your experience what seems to be the greatest challenge just coming up with the and recognizing the the the, uh, the objective or communicating that and making it clear to their their learners uh, I think it's both because they are linked and, and one depends on the other. Uh, I come to see students that have a lesson plan which seems complete, which even has a stated objective, a uh, set of stages to, and the steps to follow through the lesson plan. Uh, but at the end, when you actually ask them for examples of what you expect the students to answer, they don't they still have it clear in their mind uh, they still don't know it so uh when 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 they come to me with the lesson plan we start to discuss and, and sooner or later i come with the question so let's suppose we are in the classroom and you are the student and now we are in the core activity in which the teacher is going to realize whether you are developing the skill or or or, or the understanding you expect so tell me what you as a student are able to do right now uh with support or not support which is a different kind of topic right uh with uh, uh the, the mediation of something or not but uh what are you going to say or what are you going to be able let's think about the, the skill this is speaking reading writing what what are you going to be able to understand from the listening or understand from the reading or speak or uh or be able to to create in writing and that's when the the teachers themselves they realize that they have the idea they know the 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 linguistic topic the structural topic or the, the name the grammatical name and they yet do not have an example of what it's expected and then I tell them, how do you expect the students to answer this if you, the teacher, is not able to answer the question? Uh, so, and, and it takes me to, uh, to wonder if they have the proper material prompts and questions as to uh, make students go towards the objective. So that's the first thing on one end. So if they don't have it in clear, how do they transmit to students what i come to realize is that they also have the idea of doing something in the classroom to try to promote in students doing something with the language 
but they actually don't know what the outcome of that language is going to be. Unless they are talking about simple isolated vocabulary, that's when they, everybody knows. I want them to say this, word, this set of words and that's it. Or I want them to, uh, even when, when we talk about a sentence, they know the structure of the sentence, but they don't even have an expectation of an example. So, so yeah. that's pretty much the idea. Yeah, so, so this is interesting. So let's get into um, you know, what is an objective. So when you're saying that the, if they're not able to recognize the objective. Um, I know we've talked a lot about uh, categorizing, and this is coming from kind of a content and language integrated learning or CLIL or SIUP right. idea, uh, sheltered, uh, sheltered a protocol. And the idea here is, I mean, you can categorize objectives from either linguistic objectives, like language right. uh, objectives, or content, now content objectives. Now, I know that's a very general you know, two categories. Yeah. But um, I found it interesting to the video that you shared where they talked about Maurer's criteria for instructional uh, objectives, where he divided it up into three, what the students need to do, whether uh, they can perform the perf or complete the performance, and also the criteria of acceptance uh, or acceptable performance, and trying to incorporate those three within the objectives. I know there's there's the ABC uh, method, ABC prog, yeah. a lot of different ways of, of looking at it. What's the most practical and, in your view, the, the, the best, most useful way to articulate these uh, objectives when you're looking at uh, teaching English uh, as a, an additional language? I, I think it depends on the teacher, because uh, the teacher has different ways of looking at it, at things, and, and every student has a different way of understanding. So what I do with them is I set in the lesson plan a requirement of different elements which they have to think, which is, for example, the, uh, the form, the linguistic topic as a form. Is there gonna be a grammar form or a vocabulary or a notion of the language that is going to be mainly used and focused? That's one of the aspects. The other aspect would be what is the function of it? What is it going to be used for in this case? Well, it has a function, but uh, it may have uh, two, fun two different functions with a slight variation. So what is the function it is going to be used for in this class? And what is the context also? What is the real life situation in which you are going to implement uh, this uh, uh, idea of the class, all right? And other, uh, th those three main elements are the ones I ask for, but also I always ask them something I call the language focus example, is write a sample of a student's production when it comes to production, even though if, in, if, in, if it's not gonna come to, in this class to production, maybe it's gonna be in the understanding uh, field, in the introduction field to the topic during the class, but sooner or later, you have to come to the idea of development and students using the language. So give me an example of what you expect them to do. And then from all the, these uh, four ideas, uh, students get to uh, structure a, a sentence in an objective way, which I preferably tend to use the aspects of behavior and degree from the ABCD method of, of learning. Uh, but the idea, more than stating the degree, is them to comprehend that it's not just one element, the objective of the class. Uh, so what, from all of these aspects, uh, for some of them it's easier to think when you, when you actually make them think about the example, it's easier to think about the example. For some others, it's easier to think about the grammar term they're going to have, like the notion of the language they're going to use. For some others, they actually, I want them to describe, or I want them to uh, do um, this kind of communication, in other words, uh, like the function, right? The function of the language. So in that sense, uh, they can structure what I, uh, the, the way in which they complement the, their thought in any way they start, it just makes sense that everything aligns, that you actually have uh, uh, a form that it's, 
it's aligned with the function that it's intended for the class and at the same time that it's also coherent with the context that it's going to be used and at the same time that you have actual examples uh, simple examples that can be produced by by students sooner or later and all of those you can put them into a sentence which you can call objective but the important thing is that you have to have in mind what it, uh, and and this also including the skills focus in the class and all of these have to give you the idea of this is what i want to be in constant exposure during the class in any way yeah you mentioned early earlier there uh the word context and i'm really curious i mean i think is it worse do we just think of context as kind of okay imagine you're in the doctor's office and this is and I, that, that's that, another thing right <laughs> that's right. An, another whole topic right that's one thing and and linking that the the, the difficulty uh, i would think of setting up context because it's so important when you're talking about you know relationships of speakers you know formal informal uh, register you know and all of that you know, all of the things that go into the the context but you also mentioned evaluation and so right. how do you how do you connect the dots there how do you link that how do you guide uh, how does a you know a, a teacher just getting into the field try to wrap their heads around all of that trying to piece it all together thinking does the assessment come first do they think about assessment first or do they tend to think of it after the instruction, after the planning, and they've gotten, it, gotten into the, the class and uh, dealing with this complicated subject of context and language? I think uh, teachers can come with uh, smart ways of, let me put it with an analogy, with the smart ways of asking questions, right? With, uh, with questions that go along a talk and a topic which uh, are used for different purposes. And, and, and I think most teachers are clever enough as to elaborate the question. But uh, if you think on, on the answer first, you're gonna have a better question yet. If you, if you think on the expected answer, uh, I, I was thinking about uh, Ken's uh, talk last week about flip classroom. He's on the screen right now from, from the previous show. And, um, and, and yes, he's talking about the students go and do the research and we actually do the task in here. So this is kind of an analogy. Uh, evaluation in the class, if you start from that end, if you start thinking about uh, how am I gonna, I, maybe not in the sense of putting the number or scoring the, 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 the students just as plain, but as, uh, what, what am I going to be able to see or, or hear from the students that is showing me that they actually achieve it, something in, in language communication? If you think in, in, in the evaluation um, in any way, I think it's going to give you the better question to ask and the better way to get to it. Because otherwise, uh, if you think first on the question, on, on the way, uh, it may lead to different paths since we have individuals as students. But if you think about the answer first, if you think about the evaluation first, if you think about what the outcomes are, and this is what I want uh, my teachers to do when they think about the language focus example. What do you expect them to say or write or understand? Because that's what you want to reinforce, expose them and do it over and over again during the class. And now you can do it through uh, a quick video or through repetitions or through drillings or maybe through research and analysis students creation i don't know whatever approach you follow uh but that's the the kind of exposure you want even though they are not yet able to handle it or produce it that's what you want them it, that, that one uh, you want to have in your classroom at all time so yes evaluation it's one of the easiest way in my opinion uh, think about on matters of what you expect as an outcome from students and what characteristic that may have as part of the evaluation in uh, as a way to determine clarity on the, the starting point and the goal as a path for the class.
I think better for worse, we teach how we're going to end up testing. And I, I don't mean to say that that we teach to the test, but however students... Sorry, 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 Ben. I, uh, you are, I can listen to you a little bit, Chappie. Can you repeat that again? Sure. Um, you mentioned about, um, you know, evaluation. And I think for better or for worse, we teach the way that we end up testing our students. And I don't mean to say that we teach to the test, but what I mean is however we plan on, uh, you know, uh, evaluating our students, whether it's through performance, whether it's multiple choice, whether it's, uh, you know, some sort of presentation, however we decide to evaluate our students, that's going to influence heavily how, how we teach. And again, that can be something positive, that can be something negative in the term, in the sense of maybe standardized testing or, or some sort of exit exam where, you know, there, it's a high stakes situation and it's multiple choice and maybe that's the only way that students are being evaluated, right? That's going to really dictate how we, we teach. But I think that, you know, you mentioned something interesting about questions. And I, I remember teaching a discourse analysis uh, course where we talked a lot about uh, becoming aware of how we ask questions, how we can record our voice and really look and reflect on not only the types of questions that we ask throughout a, maybe a 15-minute class, but the, the order in which we ask those questions, the, the sequence of the questions that we ask. And I, I really encourage uh, everyone out there to, to take one class and just record yourself one class and just know, just see what kind of uh, questions you ask and how you organize those questions based on responses that you're getting in the class. I think it's very eye-opening. And you know, when we're teaching the class, we don't always, uh, we're not always aware I think of of, uh, of those types of of questions or those types of uh, ways that we're articulating or communicating with our students because we're obviously we're thinking about other things. But um, I think it really would be helpful. I think to become aware of how we're asking those questions so that we can kind of see well what what's working, what's the best or not so best way of asking certain types of questions, really to promote this deeper learning, this critical thinking, uh, looking at, you know, down the road, how we're going to be evaluating if it's some sort of performance, how can this class lead or enable students to do something else later on, so it becomes kind of a cumul cumulative effect of, of learning and gaining knowledge and gaining skills over time. But uh, yeah, I think, that's, uh, I think that's interesting, and I think it begins all with this idea of planning, uh, thinking about these objectives, I, when I watched that video, I think it uh, was eye-opening because of the different ways of looking at objectives, really. And I, you touched right. on it, uh, you know, very clearly here that there are different ways. Maybe it depends on the the student. Maybe it depends on the the class itself, the types of students. Maybe the age of the students, the level of the students, and and perhaps even the school, depending on what kind of curriculum they have. Maybe some of those objectives are, are set in stone. Maybe it comes from a book. I mean, I think we've seen cases where the curriculum actually comes from the scope and sequence of a, of a, of a book, which we can discuss later on, on what right. that entails. But uh, it's a complex question, and uh, I think I think it's something that we all should think about. And again, I think if we can hear from the audience and let let us know what you think, what what kind of uh, approaches you're taking with planning, uh, that would be great. Right, we'd right. like to hear from you and and you know what hear from you as far as what what, what works in the classroom and, and what doesn't work. Right. And and the second aspect in here would be the activity itself and the the activities in the classroom which uh, uh, the situation and, and, and the aspect, the, the, the importance of talking about the activity in here is that some teachers uh, uh, that come to me with their lesson plans, the first thing they think about, it's an activity. And they think about uh, having students, they think about the students, yes, but they think about the students from the perspective of 
Oh, I need to wake them up. I need to have them active. I need to do an activity which they enjoy, so they enjoy the class. And they think about activities, and they tend to think about interactive contests or games or things like this uh, aspect, which uh, I'm totally for it. I'm, 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 uh, uh, and and I know many teachers may not, and but but I'm totally for. Uh, but the situation in here is that is e is easier that way that the teacher leans towards focusing the class on doing the activity and having this game or this class or this contest. And what about the objective, the, the language objective for the class, right? And sometimes we even sacrifice the objective for the sakes of we are having a good time in class. The students are really paying attention and are really uh, engaged in the activity and they are trying to, uh, I don't know, to complete the worksheet or to or finish the task or, or, or win the game. But at the end, it's a very complex uh, game which takes them through a lot of activities and paths which at the end end up in the repetition of one word. <laughs> or maybe you have, uh, you as a teacher, this is something I, I, I ask my students to think about. What is your perception of the practice from students? Yes, they practice a lot. And then, okay, let's uh, be a little bit squared and think about numbers. How many times did they actually went through the structure during the class? Oh, like, I don't know, during the activity, in this activity it was 10 minutes and they did it like 15 times. All right. And, and I was like, did all students really went through it 15 times? Were they really exposed? Or, well, it was uh, one participant did it once and then another participant did it another time. And then, okay, so you spend 10, 15 minutes in a game in which they did a lot of things just to one sentence. And at the end, just one, each student and not all of them, just the one that came to participate, practiced one time uh, uh, or had exposure to the new feature in one time. Though you as a teacher, you view the the reign of, of students doing something, but it's just one time. So uh, the idea is not get rid of the activity or, or do another activity. What I encourage them to do is same activity. And now the challenge is do not change the activity. Adapt the activity and, and whatever is necessary to do in there so that they have enough exposure to the language in the in the way that the activity intends, like is the activity for uh, a presentation of the different examples, is the activity for students to practice something or produce from their own or have an integration of different topics, okay. But I want you to manage to adapt that activity in a way that they can actually have longer exposure to more times in listening, speaking, reading, or writing of this feature. And, uh, well, that's my point of view and my approach so far. And, and, and as you say, it would be really interesting to see how teachers are, are approaching this planning and this idea, because as a closure to this, I've come to see uh, teachers that plan starting from the activity, but at the end, they manage to have a, a, a good achievement of objectives. Because uh, the activity itself, they, 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 they have this skill of uh, matching the activity automatically with the objective. So it's not really the activity. It goes along with the objective. But it's not that easy to do. So, yes, the question is there. Uh, how, what, what, what would be other paths to structure our lesson of the day with the idea of... Uh, exposing students to the language in the way that the lesson is intended to. I think here it's important to mention or make a distinction between the word activity, what is an activity versus okay. oh, yeah. a performance, because we've talked again a lot about right, this right. topic of another day, but very briefly, if we, if we look at it, me personally, when I think of the word performance, I think of performance tests from Wiggins and McTighe's right. understanding by de design, um, and really looking at building up to that performance. So as your students are saying, okay, I'm, they're, they're thinking maybe first of an activity, well, maybe they can think right. first of a performance, which would be more involved, okay. something that 
that students would have to work towards over a period of certain days or weeks in order to complete and then look at all individual activities like I think that you're mentioning and looking at how those build on each other over time so that uh, when they come to do the performance, they're able to do it. That doesn't mean necessarily that they're constantly doing the performance, but they're constantly working towards that. So for example, that might be an activity one day, maybe it's a handout another day, maybe it's a, you know, a certain other type of you know, activity another day, but you're looking at it kind of as a progression of skills and knowledge and, and whatever else they need to, uh, to, to do the performance. And I have uh, spoken to other teachers about this and I feel that the more that students know what the performance is and the more that the students can buy into this idea that they like to do this or they would like to do this performance in the future, even though maybe they're not prepared to do so at that time, that ends up driving motivation because they're leading up to that performance. I think the simplest analogy for me is uh, baseball, big baseball fan, uh, St. Louis Cardinals, love them, they're great. <laughs> but the idea is that you work towards playing the game. So what mm -hmm. does that mean? Well, maybe you take uh, ground balls, you learn how to you know, uh, use, use your glove and, and pick up a ball, throw the ball, hit the ball, bunt, steal. You learn all these individual aspects of the game, but the idea is that you're building up to actually playing the game. So I think that if we can try to bring that into the classroom and really find ways of um, coming up with these performance tests, and this is a perfect opportunity where teachers can work together and develop together these performance tests that work and use those and adapt those and and modify those uh, to each class, each particular group, um, again, as a means of, of uh, promoting uh, you know, motivation and, and trying to get them to see the complexity of, and not, in this case, not just being able to speak or, or write, but to think right. and to communicate and to argue and to persuade and so on. Yes, sir, but yeah, I, I see where you're going to, uh, because that was uh, the beginning of this segment it's it's uh, i mean there's no end to this yeah. we can keep on talking and talking but it, you 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 were going towards the idea of the previous segment of of today's uh program which is the deep learning exactly mm -hmm. uh we have come to a moment in which um we realize that just as the skills and language are not in isolation all these uh, aspects of deep learning, of attitudes, behaviors, and, and, and the use of language itself, and, and, and many other aspects come around to be part of the development of students as to be successful users of the language in a world in which they're going to use the real context of it, it's interaction with other human beings. So, so I, I understand pretty much what, what were you going towards this. And, and, and I think, yeah, we, we would need. Uh, Long talks about uh, different topics and, and, and go through these minimals and go through many aspects as to be clear. Uh, but I think uh, today we raised uh, several questions and, and, and important aspects from our points of view. And, and, and that's the idea, to raise a question and have students and have uh, teachers and have the, te uh, the pre-service and in-service teachers to uh, ask the questions to themselves, to wonder, uh, how am I, what am I doing in the classroom? Am I really doing uh, things with uh, a purpose? Am I having an objective? Am I going through this deep learning? Am I uh, focusing on the activities? Am I entertaining students? Or am I entertaining students with purpose? Or, or, or what's the idea, okay? So share with us, please, share with us all your comments, your ideas, and whatever you have to say. Um, uh, as Ben usually mentions, if you disagree with us, Tell us, uh, because that's the idea, to share the, our experiences and see which other paths can be taken inside the classroom and outside the classroom in our lives as teachers. But don't forget our Facebook <laughs> page. And uh, yes, the comments there. Um, you reach out to our, our websites, let us know. Um, 
you know, if you are in contact with us at school, of course, let us know what you think. Um, and if you, if you ever want to participate in our live broadcast, feel free to contact us. We're always looking for guests. We have some very special guests uh, uh, scheduled here in the future that we're planning, um, but we're always looking for more uh, participation. So let us know, and uh, we have no problem uh, bringing you into these live broadcasts uh, to, to discuss with you di different topics of the day uh, related to teaching and learning. Uh, I think now uh, we have just, we're getting close to uh, time, but uh, we always like to end briefly at the, uh, at the end of our broadcast to talk about uh, some shared experiences. So, Piri, I don't know if you have anything uh, to share for this week. Sorry, just to make a mention, something that is working really good for me is uh, in the classes that, that I've taught during these previous two weeks, uh, I've been uh, adding in the presentations, in the PowerPoint presentations I use, I'm adding one slide with a screenshot of an article related to the topic, uh, like extended information, or in another occasion I did it with one of the, of the aspects to mention about the topic. And, but in that slide, I do not make any explanation. I just invite the students to uh, look at the article, and then I send and I upload the article to a Facebook group we have, and, and I encourage them to. I just mention what is the slide about, what is the the aspect about, what is the article about, and I encourage them to go and look for it. And uh, it seems that some of them are actually going and looking at the articles. And I just wanted to share that. Uh, I think um, I, I think it's nothing new. I, I I'm sure somebody has done this before, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like the idea, and I think it's something I'm going to keep on doing it because uh, um, uh, it saves time a little bit. Uh, it, it, if you want to extend more, you can uh, round edges and, and leave certain things for the article, and, and you can take certain aspects just to raise interest and just mention them very briefly. Or, or if you have many aspects to cover in few time, you can select a couple of the of the of the aspects of the topic that you want to make clear, and just uh, uh, lead the students to, towards the reference. And the idea in here is that I I not only just mention it, I put on a screenshot with uh, uh, with what I consider maybe interesting to look at, an image from the article, or or uh, sometimes there's a diagram or a graph. Uh, I put it there. And, and, and it looks like uh, some of them are actually going and, and looking at it. Okay. Um, uh, what I would like to share just uh, very briefly, you know, since I teach a lot of writing classes, a lot of my experiences are related to, to, to those types of issues. Um, but uh, this week we worked uh, a lot as my students are developing uh, academic essays, and many of these uh, students are creating a, an academic essay for the first time. We talked a lot about and we have talked a lot about in the past uh, the importance of setting up a thesis statement, the main idea. And I think this links a little bit to what we talked about today when most, it's interesting that throughout the writing process, we keep coming back to the main idea. Like what is the purpose of writing this particular uh, text in this, in this case? And it's not for, and it's not because I'm asking for it. It's not because it's for a grade. It should be some, for some quote unquote authentic uh, or purposeful uh, uh, situation. So a lot of times stu students will have to imagine because we're not yet in a position to actually write essays for, uh, for a, a real live audience. But the idea is to think of in terms of who might read this, who's it for, really trying to look for a target audience, not just a potential audience, but the main audience, the main uh, group of, of people who would benefit the most from having read their, their articles. And, uh, really, this helps students move and try to limit their language when they start using words like people or person, these nondescript uh, words that are being used that uh, really are not very descriptive and uh, of, of to why they're, they're actually writing this. So, you know, if you're teaching uh, students to, even if it's uh, like speaking, if it's public speaking or if it's just some sort of presentation, whatever they're doing, trying to figure out, well, what's the purpose or what's the main idea of what I'm trying to communicate or what I'm trying to do? Who's the audience? What's the relationship between 
you, the creator, either the writer, the speaker, and the audience, and really looking at language, again, well, I'll use the word context, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what's the context of this situation? And having them be able to justify why they're doing certain things, whether, again, it's, it's within a text or with, if it's within a presentation, but kind of looking and talking kind of meta about their, their work and the language. And, and I think if, if we look at it like this, things like context become a little bit more apparent. They become more obvious. And we, we stop looking at these isolated work uh, or, or activities that really uh, have no context or maybe have less uh, of a purpose than what they might, uh, might have otherwise. So I just wanted to share that. And, and the way that, um, that we work, we're lucky at the university to have screens and computers in each of our school, uh, each of our classrooms. So a lot of our students, in my case, they can benefit. I can share work among each of the students. We work very transparently. All of the, my feedback that I give students, everyone sees all my feedback and everyone sees each other's work. So it's kind of a combination of having this meta con conversation about thesis or the main idea or the purpose of one's work and this idea of trying to work as transparent as, uh, as possible. So that's basically all I have. Petey, I don't know if you have anything else. Well, no, just to invite our audience to go back to previous videos. Many of the things we discussed today are related to previous topics. Context itself, well, I think we discussed something about context on the on some of the, the second or third uh, program, I guess, uh, very briefly. But uh, I would be interested of talking again about this context idea and uh, and uh, and I, I like uh, the way this is working in the show, having all these different talks which at the end come together and 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 have a vision of um, in this case today I guess we're talking about the purposes uh, of of uh, of classes of the task of the activities of writing purposes in general and uh, we can skip to evaluation and context and see all these topics tell us what you are interested in listening or sharing with us. Same way, I always finish these conversations with a, a list of things that we can talk about in the future. But again, we would rather hear from you and hear what you would like us to talk about. So again, uh, feel free to let us know if you want to propose a topic, whether you want to participate or not, uh, please do so. Uh, we want to make this uh, as open as possible. So um, if we don't hear from you, we'll keep uh, coming up with topics. We, we have, uh, there's no shortage of topics for us to talk about. But uh, yeah, let us know. Uh, we really appreciate you listening and watching both in, in the live broadcast and in the videos. Um, and uh, again, we hope to see you in, uh, in a future broadcast. I think that's all I have uh, for now. Petey, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And uh, uh, from my end, uh, I wish everyone the best and we'll see you in the next broadcast. Thank you, Ben. And everybody, thank you for watching and listening. Keep on learning.